Tiz Jones was a colorful and storied character who achieved a good deal of notoriety and regional infamy in his lifetime. He was a celebrated amateur prize fighter in West Virginia during the 1930s and 40s. He was a career criminal, convicted multiple times for burglary, home invasion, breaking and entering, and related offenses for which he spent much of his adult life in and out of county jails and state prison, at one point during which, according to his own version of his life story, he got religion and committed his life to the Lord. He was a licensed minister in the Church of the Nazarene, generating quite a following during the 1950s as a traveling preacher, holding tent revivals throughout the Appalachian region of West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, even becoming a sort of unofficial prison chaplain at the West Virginia State Penitentiary in Moundsville, where he had served time as a prisoner and, to much public shame, would do so again. He was a gifted and eloquent storyteller, especially, it would seem, in areas pertaining to his own life and personal accomplishments, as he had an evident proclivity towards dishonesty, creative embellishment, and social manipulation. Suggesting the manner in which Tiz frames his own life story should be considered with some degree of scrutiny, including, I would think, perhaps aspects through which he characterizes himself in the guise of humility and contrition. In the public eye, Tiz Jones was often lauded as a compassionate and dedicated husband and father. But in the quieter circles of relatives and confidants, as well as some psychiatric professionals, he was often regarded as violently abusive, paranoid, and untrusting, and diagnosed as harboring untreatable sociopathic inclinations. Tiz Jones was my grandfather. While I never met him, or at least if I did, I was too young to have retained any memory of doing so, digging into family history archives to learn more about the man Tiz Jones was, and to make sense of the legacy he left behind, has involved a journey of discovery, revealing some especially interesting artifacts, such as what you're about to hear. Unshackled is a live broadcast radio dramatization produced in the style of the golden age of radio and broadcasts each week to thousands of radio stations around the world, as it has done since 1950, making it the longest-running such program in radio history. Produced as part of the ministerial efforts of the Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago, Illinois, Unshackled features dramatizations based on personal testimonies of individuals who had undergone a dramatic conversion to evangelical Christianity. While Pacific Garden Mission's more than a century of charitable service in providing shelter, clothing, food, and health care to Chicago's homeless is certainly incontestable and inspiring in its own right, I personally and emphatically do not endorse the theological angle that underscores their operations though I certainly understand its value in the lives of those seeking that particular brand of spiritual guidance and fulfillment. But in terms of the supposed truth in the featured testimonies of Unshackled, granted I can only speak in regards to the Tiz Jones story, I think it's important to keep in mind that in context of a radio program that dramatizes and broadcasts the self-dictated life stories of individuals desperate for validation, to a consuming audience that is desperate to believe them, the truth is subjective. And so, for this four-part series featuring the 1953 Unshackled broadcast on the life of Tiz Jones, I'll be rounding out that true testimony using a bit of supplemental context with which I'll be bookending each episode. And now, on with our show. How do you do? Mind if we ask you to move? That's right, to leave those comfortable chairs and come with us right through the heart of Chicago's loop into another world. A world of cheap hotels, taverns, honky-tonks, missions, and pawn shops to the street of forgotten men and women. Forgotten, that is, until their minds and hearts, their very lives are unshackled.
From Chicago, the crossroads of America, the Pacific Garden Mission presents Unshackled, the unique dramatic series using real names in true stories and brought to you each week by the famous old Pacific Garden Mission, the lighthouse which for three quarters of a century has been offering the secret of a new life to the men and women of Chicago's Skid Row, but which now, through this unusual broadcast, reaches up and out of Skid Row toward those who walk the avenues and boulevards of our world. Yes, this is Unshackled, the program you support, the broadcast which is changing lives wherever it is heard. Some time ago, while she was vacationing with her parents in her hometown of Charleston, West Virginia, Eugenia Price, our writer-producer, met a man whose story she felt she had to do on Unshackled. If you found these true stories of lives which have been amazingly transformed hard to believe in the past three years, we predict that if you'll listen this week and next, the same may be true, but you may begin to believe something else which can change your life, too. This highly dramatic sequence of absolutely true events would be cluttered by more preliminary comment from me. The man whose life story we bring you now is here in the studio with his wife. His name is Jones. Tis Jones. If you live in or near Charleston, West Virginia, you've probably heard of him, but wherever you live, for as long as you live, you may thank God that you met Mr. Tiz Jones on Unshackled. Hiya. You're probably thinking, did that fellow say Tiz Jones? Yep, he did. My real name's Clarence, but my dad, who was God as far as I was concerned, nicknamed me Tizzle when I was a kid. And when I grew up and became a boxer, first amateur, then professional, the name Tiz Jones stuck. Stuck in a lot of people's craws, too, because before I was 30, one-time boxing fans of mine in my hometown of Charleston, West Virginia, got so they'd cross the street when they saw me coming. Because my very presence meant trouble. Or at least a touch for a few bucks. Not that I ever wanted for anything at home. I didn't. My dad, Jack Jones, was a top-notch drilling contractor and made good money. But I was ashamed to go to him. I loved him too much. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of my story. Uh, after I graduated from Elkview High School, outstanding athlete in my class, I went to Augusta Military Academy in Virginia on a scholarship which I won on my boxing merit. Brother, I figured I had it all. Looks, physique, boxing know-how, and a brand new, classy uniform. <laughs> I felt sorry for the gals I met. Tiz met gals, too, dozens of them, all of whom seemed to share Tiz's own opinion of himself. Very classy, very sharp, very big-hearted to give of his time to the little damsels with the admiring eyes and the palpitating hearts. But one night... When Tiz was 20 and home in Charleston on vacation, he went to a dance alone, and while looking around to see whose girlfriend he wanted to take, his roving eye caught sight of a slight, pert little brunette dancing as light as a willow leaf, with something in a dark suit whose identity didn't even interest Tiz. Across the floor went Cadet Jones in his flashy uniform, the only one in the ballroom, cut in on the little brunette and whirled her away, and into the madcap hectic turmoil of his own life. I was that girl. My name's Kathleen. Tiz says I was different. I know he was. One way I was like the others, though. I fell for Tiz. But where the big difference came in, Tiz fell for me, too. He was like a thunderhead building up to... I, I didn't know. I loved the ground he walked on. And I was scared all at the same time. I was proud of the way he strutted, and I wanted to, to tie him down, to and keep him still. Like the night Tiz and I were walking toward my home in Charleston. Hey, where'd you look at the rookie? Yeah, get a look at the uniform. Hey, who said that? Oh, nobody, Tiz. Don't bother. Uh, who said that? Did you? Yeah. We know you're Katie's big soldier boy, but you're just a punk rookie to us. Hiya, rookie. Ain't he pretty, though? You won't get a chance to say that again. Oh, oh, please. Please. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop 
Me? Are you kidding? Come on. Those two boys went home that night and reported that a bunch of Marines had jumped on them. Tiz Jones was off, fighting inside and out. His rapid rise in the amateur boxing world went straight to his handsome, curly head. The only person Tiz looked up to ever was his dad. Oh, I love my mother. She's a quiet, gentle woman, a deep thinker. A wonderful mother with a great faith in God. The only one in our family with a faith as I grew up. But to me, my dad didn't need a faith in God. He practically was God to me. All he needed was self-confidence. And he had that. He was the strongest man physically I've ever known. When we got stuck in the mud somewhere when I was a boy, Dad just lifted the front of our old baby overland out. He was a drilling contractor, oil and gas wells in West Virginia. And nothing thrilled me more during college vacation than to be on top of one of those mountains working a night shift as my dad's tool dresser. He didn't use chain blocks to pull a big heavy iron bit to the fire. He just lifted it over in his big arms. And I marveled and loved him even more. Now, lots of times we just sit out there together. Other times we talked about anything and everything. Your mother's the best, Tizzle. She walks right with God. We ought to try to take more interest for her sake. Oh, religion's all right for children and old women with lace collars. And your mother. She's not old. Well, you know what I mean, Dad. You and I look funny singing hymns. <laughs> you really think I would, son? Yeah. What do you need with God? You can do anything. <laughs> that makes a man feel good to hear his son say that. I wish it were true. You know where I fall down, Tiz. You're smart. You're a university man. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't seem to stay put, Dad. I, I just didn't like the last school I tried. I... I think everything will be Jake, though, when I get started this year at Tennessee. You really think so, Tiz? Yep. That other place was uh, too tame or something. You don't think the trouble could be inside you like inside me, do you? What do you mean? Now, we're both like big cats on the prowl, Tiz. Your brothers and sisters seem peaceful inside. Oh, Dad, for the love of... Okay, okay. Skip it. I was just wondering, son. Just wondering. I got bored at the University of Tennessee just the same as I had at Augusta Military Academy in the University of Miami. Just the same as I would have any place. And so just short of three years of university credits, I chucked it and came back to Charleston and began to fight seriously, both in and out of the ring. Now, all this time, Kathleen, my wife, stuck close, at least in her heart. I didn't stay home enough for her to be close much. I was a married man with one fine son and another one on the way, but I couldn't stay put. I just couldn't or wouldn't assume the responsibility of being married. From one night out a week, it became two, then three. Then I'd get boiling drunk, and Kathleen wouldn't know where I was for a whole week at a time. Tiz Jones became acquainted with the inside of a jail about here. Became well acquainted, in fact, from frequent visits for drunkenness and disorderly conduct. And yet he was so good in the ring, he kept right on climbing up and up between bouts with the bottle until he became amateur heavyweight champion of West Virginia and turned professional. There are sports writers and fans in the Charleston area who right today will swear that Tiz could have become world champ if he'd stayed sober. Then something happened which Tiz just could not accept. His big, strong daddy fell ill. The arms that once had swung an iron drilling bit around faster than the pulley chain could swing it lay helpless on top of the blue and white patchwork quilt Tiz's grandmother had made. Tiz's god had fallen. Dad, this is... this is crazy. You can't get sick. You're just getting started. You're only 46, Dad. Yes, listen to me. It's going to knock you off your pins worse than me getting sick. But you'll be wrong, son. What do you mean, I'll be wrong? You'll think what I'm going to tell you is crazier than my getting sick, but you'll be wrong. It's the best thing that ever happened to your old dad. 
Tis I belong to Jesus Christ now, too, like Mother. Dad. That's right, son, that's right. I suspect the doctor thinks I'm going to kick off, and he may be right. But I won't really be dead, Tis. I've got eternal life now, because I finally took my faith away from Jack Jones and put it in Jesus Christ. Well, son, don't you have anything to say? Well, I... I still got my faith in you, Dad. You're not going to die. I won't let you. It is more than anything I know. I want to get out of here right now and go tell everyone about the peace and the joy I found. But I believe I'm going to have to do my talking on the other side, son. But I told you. And when I see Jesus, let me be able to say, Lord, I brought one. I brought my boy, Tizzle. Think about it, Tiz. Put your faith, your faith in Christ, will you? I, I still got my faith in you, Dad. And you're not going to die. I won't let you. Big Jack Jones did die a few months later. And his big son, Tiz, now a professional fighter, really went off the deep end to hide his broken heart, he encased it with layer after layer of tough guy veneer. He was still roughly handsome in spite of his broken nose and scarred lips, trademarks of his boxing profession. His little wife Kathleen still loved him more than most women ever understand about loving. But Tiz Jones was flying to pieces fast inside. His heavy drinking bouts came oftener. He quit his union trade of pipe fitting and began gambling for a living. Gambling and drinking, drinking, drinking. Chad, I, I won't do it again. I, I'm bigger than this stuff. I'm Tiz Jones. I don't need to let a, a bottle lick me. I'm Tiz Jones. I, I just won't let things be like this. How can you help it? I can do anything. Tiz, someday you'll have to humble yourself to somebody, somewhere. Who? I don't know. But you've walked over everybody you've ever known. And it won't work that way forever. I'll never humble myself to anybody anywhere as long as I live. Oh, honey. I'm so sorry for you. Me? Yes, I, I've done everything I know to do to help you. I don't need any help. Nothing's going to lick me. If only you could get rid of that awful pride. Why? I like it. Tears, I'd, I'd rather die than to have to tell you this. Why? We're going to have another baby. There were three boys already. This was another little boy. We named him Philip Mark. He lived six months and died. I was in Texas when the wire came, pipe fitting again, trying to be a good father, supposed to be sending money home. I drank so much. What happened was that I... Had to ride a bus back to Charleston because I didn't have plane fare. And I got there after they had already buried my little boy. Tears. Would it help any if the children and I went back to Texas with you this time? It's a good job there. We'll go, honey, if it'll help any. You think it will? I don't know. Aren't you about ready to give up on me? I don't know. Well, who does then? Will it help any if... We do go to? It might. Let's try it. And so comes to a close part one of our series, The Tiz Jones Story, featuring the unshackled radio dramatization on the life of my grandfather, Tiz Jones, originally broadcast in September of 1953. Included in the imagery accompanying part one of this series, you may have noticed intermittent newspaper articles correlating thematically with the content of the broadcast. These articles were part of an exclusive, in-depth series on the life of Tiz Jones and were published in serial form in the Raleigh Register and Beckley Post-Herald during April and May of 1957, nearly four years after this episode of Unshackled was originally broadcast. Much of what Tiz Jones dictated about his life 
to the scriptwriters of Unshackled appeared nearly word for word in those later articles, likewise dictated to the newspaper columnist, but with significant portions expanded upon, perhaps embellished, certainly polished and perfected toward greater emotional impact for the intended audience. Why that story was serialized for newspaper readership in 1957 is certainly a matter for consideration, but I'll leave that for one of our later segments. For now, we leave Tiz Jones at a low point in his life, struggling with hardship and loss. Does he have a hard road ahead, or is there hope on the horizon? There is more to come in part two of this series, and you won't want to miss it. So, until then, thank you for watching. See you soon.